Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to make a brief mention tonight of Paul Walker, who died recently at the age of 40. Paul Walker was one of the stars of the Fast and Furious movie series, along with Vin Diesel. Walker played undercover cop Brian O'Connor in the series. He died in a fiery crash in Southern California. He was in the passenger seat of a 2005 Porsche Carrera GT that slammed into a light pole and burst into flames in Santa Clarita, about 30 miles north of Hollywood. I just want to say that this recalls George Carlin's distinction between irony and coincidence. It's a coincidence that one of the stars of the Fast and Furious series would die in a car crash. As Carlin would say by itself, that's not ironic. What's ironic is that Paul Walker was the passenger and not the driver in the car. We're going to move on now to Eleanor Parker, who died recently at the age of 91. Eleanor Parker was a movie star in the late 40s and early 50s. She was hot from a career standpoint. She was pretty good looking, too. Started out her movie career in the mid-40s, but it was from 1950 to 1955 that she really shined. She won three Academy Award nominations in that time. 1950, she got one for the movie Cage, where she had her head shaved. In 51, she got one for Detective Story, playing opposite Kirk Douglas. But probably her best role in the movies was in 1955, where she got her third nomination. She never won for Interrupted Melody. It's the biopic of Australian opera star Marjorie Lawrence. The schmaltzy picture, Marjorie Lawrence becomes a big opera star, then gets polio. She's in a wheelchair. Glenn Ford's in it. Glenn Ford was in every other movie in the 1950s. Eleanor Parker did a pretty good job, and if you like opera, her opera scene was dubbed by Eileen Farrell. As a young girl raised in the bush country of Australia, Marjorie Lawrence dreamed of the time she would be a great singer. And then one day came the big opportunity, an audition for a scholarship to Paris. It was a tight squeeze, but the impulsive country girl made good and traveled halfway around the world to start her fabulous career. Not since the great Caruso has any motion picture presented the world's most beautiful music as it was meant to be heard. Not since the Stratton story has a life story been portrayed with such heartwarming romance, such emotional honesty. You'll see Lawrence, the brilliant personality, whose golden voice won the hearts of the world. Lawrence, the star, who at the height of her success on two continents found the man of her heart and had to make a choice. You mean you give up all the rest of it? I've had all of them. I just want to be Mrs. Thomas King. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Lawrence, the woman in love, who had everything she could desire. Then suddenly... How sick am I? Don't tell me the truth. Pretty sick. But you're going to be all right. I promise you that. You're going to be all right. Here is a story that will live forever in your heart. A story of courage. It's the only other movie I know where they use Somewhere Over the Rainbow. You get the idea, that kind of schmaltzy stuff. Ironically, none of those is Eleanor Parker's most famous picture. Her star fell in the late 50s and she started doing television, but she had one more reprise, and it's the thing that she's probably most known for. She was in The Sound of Music opposite Christopher Plummer and Julie Andrews in 1965, and she was the woman who Christopher Plummer throws over to marry Julie Andrews. And since none of her other movies was that big a hit, that's what everybody asked her about for the rest of her life. The other thing I get a kick out of about reading about her was that she was a nice Protestant girl born in Cedarville, Ohio. But after her movie career in the late 60s, she converted to Judaism. And she said, well, I think at heart we're all Jews. So there you go. Well, as long as we're in Ohio, we'll go to our next subject, and that's Jim Hall, who died recently at the age of 83. And Jim Hall was one of the great jazz guitarists of our era. In fact, I mentioned him just about two weeks ago when Chico Hamilton died, because Chico Hamilton was actually the guy who discovered him, and I mentioned it when we did the Chico Hamilton podcast. Jim Hall started out in Cleveland, not too far from where Eleanor Parker was born, and then he moved to Los Angeles. Here's the story of how he came out to California and met Chico Hamilton. And this was in the, what, 50s, 55, I guess. You could d deliver a car. Somebody needed a car to deliver to the West Coast. You could do it and just pay for the gas. So a saxophone player named Ray Graziano and I drove this lavender Cadillac convertible to Los Angeles from Cleveland. Went to Los Angeles. I had heard of Chico Hamilton, of course, and was a French horn player named Johnny Grass called me to rehearse with him for a quartet, and I was at John's house. It was one of those 
things of just being at the right place at the right time. And Chico Hamilton called Johnny and said, I'm looking for a guitar player. And John said, I just happened to have one. Must have been the next day or so. I went over to Chico's house and auditioned. And uh, I got a job with Chico Hamilton, who was forming this new quintet. The Chico Hamilton Quintet and a kaleidoscopic interplay of a wonderful tune, A Nice Day. Quite unusual. It was uh, cello. Fred Cat played cello. Buddy Collette. Buddy played flute and clarinet and, and alto and tenor. Carson Smith played bass and Chico played drums. Jim Hall was very, first of all, he was very studious. He was cool and he would have made his reputation sooner or later, regardless of whether it was with the quintet or had his own thing going on. Everybody realized right away that Jim Hall was quite a talent, and when he left Chico Hamilton, he moved east, he went to New York, and he was playing with the Jim Jeffrey Three, and they played with all the great jazz musicians of the late 50s, when jazz was a mainstream influence in American culture. Here's Nat Hentoff, who probably knows as much about jazz as anybody, talking about what the jazz scene was like in New York at that time. At one place, at one time, you had Thelonious Monk, Count Basie, Rex Stewart, Red Allen, Lester Young, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, my God, it was like uh, Greek mythology. Zeus and his pals were there. And alas, practically all of them are dead now. So that was a moment in jazz history, and Jim was an important part of that. One of the gods he played with was Sonny Rollins, and here's what the great saxophonist has to say about Jim Hall. He was able to be a dominant player, a very forceful player, but he was also sensitive. You know, that was remarkable. So he was ideal, as far as I was concerned, for the band that uh, we had together. Of course, the dominant culture of the time in jazz was black, but Jim Hall fit in quite well. Here's Nat Hentoff to talk about that. Jim was courageous enough at one point, and I quoted him in one of my books, I think Jazz Is, to say that not only black musicians can play authentic jazz. At that time, that took a bit of courage. I remember when Miles hired Bill Evans, he got an awful lot of criticism from black musicians. And Miles said, I don't give a damn if, he, if he's purple or green, so long as he can play. So Jim really sees things as integrated, not by some kind of mechanical means. It's the way people are and should live. Well, as we talked about before, 1964 was a critical year because that's when the Beatles came. And jazz sort of lost its cachet with the advent of... British rock and roll. There weren't as many jazz gigs and Jim Hall had to make a living, so he went to play on, get this, the Merv Griffin Show as part of Mort Lindsay's orchestra, and here he's doing a mock audition for Merv. Who's that? This is Jim Hall. He's visiting with us tonight. Oh. He's the world's foremost guitarist. Oh, oh. He's won every jazz poll at the Every jazz poll? Right. Only a son of a gun. Is he any good? He's marvelous. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> How oh, good. Has he auditioned yet? I mean, nobody just walks into this band more than plays. Well, he's a friend of everybody. I will test him. Are you oh, ready? You want to play? Yeah. Let's see, Jim. I will pick the key of E flat. You play in that key? Nice. He was good enough to play on the Merv Griffin Show. Here's Nat Hentoff in closing on Jim Hall. His music is deep, and the feeling is deep. And I think he's in the pantheon. Again, I, I always think of Duke in these terms. He used to say about very few musicians, he'd say, that person is beyond category. And that really is the way to put it. Jim is the odd category. Well, our final subject tonight is Dick Dodd, who died recently at the age of 68. And Dick Dodd was a California boy through and through. I guess we sandwiched our Ohio people between California people. Dick Dodd was a minor Mouseketeer in the 50s. He may have learned to play the drums from Cubby on the Mouseketeers. And then he got a dance cameo behind Ann Margaret and Bye Bye Birdie. Then he used his drumming skill to hook up with one of the early garage rock bands of Southern California. Remember, we did Sean Bonnewell of the Music Machine. 
But Dick Dodd was part of the Standells, and the Standells had one really big hit, especially in Boston. Dick Dodd did the opening for it, and even though he'd never been out to Boston, he was talking about that Charles River. I'm going to tell you a story, man. Dick Dodd with Dirty Water. I bet he never had to buy a beer in Boston after that. About 15 years ago, the Red Sox made that their anthem, and he got to sing it at the World Series in 2004. A lot of people thought that Standells were one-hit wonder, but they had a pretty good follow called Sometimes Good Guys Don't Wear White. And Dick Dodd's the lead on that one, too. And some of my friends here have been a little trouble And some say I'm a little bit of a race But tell your mama and your papa I gotta do a brief segue here. The guy who wrote both of those songs was the Standells producer, a guy named Ed Cobb. He was with the Four Preps in the late 1950s. Out of Hollywood High, the Four Preps did a couple of good songs, including 26 Miles. They did a great parody of the groups of the late 50s. And then he went on to writing. He wrote Dirty Water in 1966, but before that, in 1964, he wrote a song for a black female R&B artist who was friends with Billy Preston. Here it is by Gloria Jones. And I lost my Ed Cobb wrote that one before he wrote Dirty Water, and you may not recognize it. Didn't even make the charts, but 17 years later, in 1981, Tainted Love by Soft Cell became one of the biggest hits in the world, arguably a bigger song than Dirty Water. I lost my life, for I tossed and turned, I can't sleep at night, once I ran to you. So Ed Cobb wrote that one and Dirty Water, but back to Dick Dodd. Standells had a gig on the Monsters. They weren't very good, but hey, it was the Monsters. Those days, television could get those Southern California garage bands cheap. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And besides television, American International Pictures could get those garage bands cheap. They got Dick Dodd and the Standells for a 1967 movie called Ride on Sunset Strip. As we've mentioned previously, this is about when rock and roll was taking over the Sunset Strip in Southern California. Here's Dick Dodd and the Standells from the movie. I think we have the same narration as we did for the Eleanor Parker clip. Hey, I just got a great idea. Let's all go to Pandora's Box tonight. Crazy. Oh, I dig that. Hey, you want to come too? Oh, I think I should stay home. Oh, come on, you can make it, Andy. It's a ball. Okay. These are not dangerous revolutionaries in a beleaguered city under martial law. These are teenagers on the Sunset Strip in Los Angeles, California, on a peaceful night. Irresponsible, wild, beat, protest you. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. No goal in life. Just searching for one thing they've demanded throughout the ages. The right of self-expression and recognition. What you see here is happening all over the world. In every country, the question is the same. What to do about the youth problem? Uh, it's getting worse every night. I've never seen such riffraff. Now, the authorities ought to do something about it. I'm sick and tired of it. The parents are beginning to scare because of the siren. Just a place for black and white cars to race. It's
causing a riot. It's causing a riot.